Before we get into the conversation, I just want to say a few words about the author of this book, um, who is somebody that I am very lucky to count as a friend and colleague. Dr. Leslie Marie Buer is a fellow medical anthropologist, a community-based researcher, and a harm reductionist. Uh, I first encountered Leslie Marie and her work with and in Appalachian communities of women who use drugs, face state-mandated requirements to navigate various treatment and other systems at an anthropology conference, actually very soon after I moved here about three years ago. Uh, I had just read a different book that is also about women, drug use, and treatment, but that book struck me very differently. When I had read that book, it felt pretty sensationalized and othering. And then I walked into a conference panel and heard Leslie Marie talking about her fieldwork in Eastern Kentucky and the women that she'd met as they were undergoing scrutiny and surveillance and indignity dealing with child protective services, jails, stigmatizing and in inaccessible treatment. And the way what she described and the way she described it was just a breath of fresh air. It was so different. Um, it, was ups it was upsetting. The things that people had to go through was upsetting, but the way that she spoke about them, it was very clear that she was not speaking for them. She was articulating their experiences in a way that felt respectful, it felt authentic, and it felt like she had spent time with folks, they had shared their experiences, and she was just wanting to make that accessible. So it felt very different from a lot of academic conference panels, and it felt really different from the book I had just read. So I feel like I've been waiting a long time for this book. Um, I'm so excited to get to be in conversation with Leslie Marie, um, and I'm just excited that you get to hear about it. So we are also blessed that Leslie Marie is now working full time in harm reduction, direct service and research nearby in Knoxville. Um, so I'm excited that we are about to have this conversation. Um, we're gonna jump right into questions. And again, for anybody who's just jumped on, this is being recorded. Um, we are going to talk about a couple different themes tonight. We're going to talk some about caregiving. We're going to talk some about gender roles, motherhood, reproductive justice, harm reduction, uh, radical community care, all the good stuff. Um, so Leslie Marie, in this book, you describe caregiving responsibilities of women using drugs or trying to access treatment. Um, and so kind of three part question. I was hoping you could talk about how women are forced into these responsibilities. Um, what opportunities that caregiving represents, both within families and communities and also in terms of access to treatment or legal supports. And then the folks you worked with, what did they make of the situations that they ended up in, in terms of caregiving that was either sought or unsought? Well, and I think overall, and this is through society, we um, tend to force um, people who we perceive as women as, to be the caregivers in our society and that's from a family perspective so a lot we know a lot of child care burden gets put on um, on people who identify as mothers but it's also in other ways so a lot of um, el el <laughs> elder caregiving sort of goes on um, and and women especially daughters and sisters tend to be more responsible for that in the family and then also in the community so um, and it's no different here as in the rural communities, you know, when you go to a PTA event, um, the mothers are expected to be there. Um, and it's filled with that. And that's sort of, especially in a small community where everybody knows everybody, that's what makes you a quote unquote good mother in that community is if you're showing up in the community. And so those are really placed on people um, by society, but then it's under intense, surveillance um, from even before someone who can get pregnant does get pregnant. They are put under uh, this surveillance of are they doing certain things too much? Are they having too many sexual partners? Are they using too many drugs? And they're seen as toxic to children from the very beginning, even while all this burden of care work is being placed on them, um, which is it's, it's just really complicated and it just it puts so much weight on a person um, and having said that I've sort of just described caregiving it sounds like this horrible burden right but it, I mean it's not there's a lot of opportunities with that too and and a lot of caring and hope and um, love that goes in with that it just can be exhausting and so it's interesting because of the care work that um, women were seen as giving, they sometimes had access to services that other people didn't have access to. Um, 
And in this particular instance, it was access to some treatment programs. And some people wanted that, which is good that they had access to that. But then other people just felt more burdened by those treatment prog programs because they weren't giving people what they needed. And it was just, it just felt like more and more hoops to jump through that dads did not have to do. They didn't have to do any of it. Um, and, it, and even within the treatment programs, women were asked to care for each other because they were so underfunded and understaffed that actually a lot of the work were put on, was put on participants. Um, and it's a lot of unpaid work, right? Which continues this legacy of unpaid care work um, in Appalachia, but also of course in the broader US uh, and globally. And so um, people had really different feelings about relationships within, within treatment and also care work. And so it became in some ways a double-edged sword. And so I have um, one person I talk about a lot in the book um, his name is Sissy, and uh, she's just a freaking fantastic person. Um, and she was able to articulate and theorize things uh, so much with me. And I had a lot of good phone conversations with her, in-person conversations too. Um, so I'll just read a bit from what she said. Um, and here she's talking about one of the treatment programs, Horizons, which is for uh, women who are facing uh, child protective services charges and also have some sort of substance use um, issues, whether that's testing positive for um, Xanax and cannabis a few times or having like a decades long um, heroin use. And so it's people with very widely different on the continuum of use. So this is what she said. When I asked Sissy about the best parts of Horizons, relationships took center stage. She said, definitely the girls, they helped. At the same time, it was like going through a landmine field. You never knew when one of them would freak out on you because they had had a bad day in court. They were a blessing and a curse at the same time, like most things. Get a bunch of girls together and emotion is going to come out eventually. I think if you get a bunch of anybody together, but anyway, um, I mean, that's the way it is, especially when we're going through the things we were going through. Me too. There's days I went in crying too, not just them. So while she valued her friendships through Horizons, Ashley, another person I talked to quite a bit, cited other participants as being the biggest hurdle to cease, ceasing use. And she did want to cease use. It makes it hard. Like there was a girl, we were in the middle of class and we look over and she's passed out. She came to class high as hell. So seeing that stuff sucks. I can't get high, so why the hell can you? And some of those girls I really care about and I'm seeing them hurt themselves and living that life and it sucks. So it's not only seeing others use that is difficult, but Horizons asked Ashley to continue to care for those who may overdose, die, and abandon her. After her children and their father moved out of the area and with few established relationships nearby, Ashley had a limited network of supportive people. Ashley had one close friend, but she died in an overdose. Ashley's mom had died a few years earlier and another close friend she lived with died of an overdose as well. I think that's, an, quoting her, I think that's another reason I don't really hang out with anybody because everyone I've ever loved usually overdoses, you know what I mean? Or they're still using and I can't be around them. So the care work that is built into the program feels good and supportive. At the same time, it is draining, explosive, explosive and even dangerous, as when someone breaks confidentiality. For several people, relationships outside of treatment were torn apart when a staff member or client repeated something that was said in counseling sessions. While the work performed is remuner remunerated in some ways, primarily relying on women's voluntary care work continues gendered exploitation. At best, the mostly female staff receives low wages. And so for them, that, that care work was, was so important, but it's hard work and they're not being compensated for it um, in, in any way. And it's really the state using them um, to, perform treatment when they have no training to do that and are not compensated to do that in any way. Thank you. Um, 
So a follow-up question on that. People perceived as women and raising children are more likely to have caregiving responsibilities already, as you said, um, irrespective or before any drug use. So especially for folks who haven't read the book yet or may not be as familiar with the dynamics of substance use and kind of social networks of substance use, can you tell us a little bit about how drug use might intensify gendered caregiving, especially in the context of stigma and criminalization? Yeah, and I think, so this has a lot of different aspects of it. And one is certainly a class um, aspect. So as people become more criminalized and have records, whether that's uh, criminal records or through family court, they're no longer able to access, um, one, a lot of state services. So they may not qualify for housing or um, food services or other such things. And even locally, um, sometimes folks will get kicked out of uh, certain programs if they test positive a few times and they can never use those resources again. Um, so for example, we see that in Knoxville quite a bit with um, housing issues and people no longer being able to access that. So not coming from the state, but coming from a nonprofit. Um, and when you don't have access to those resources, then you're kind of left to deal with everything, everything on your own. Um, and then if you don't have access to a job that pays a living wage because of those charges, it's much harder to um, get childcare or, or things like that. Um, I think also because of families tend to have a lot of stigma and don't get me wrong, I, I understand some, some families are taken to the brink of care and they, they just can't provide any more care. And that's fair. I mean, I, I understand that. But um, other families oftentimes might give, give up on folks really quickly because of the stigma of substance use. And so they think if someone has used any substances, they immediately cut that person off. So all of a sudden that person, um, is left without any support systems from their family. Um, and just in terms of the care work that people have to do in treatment, that's asking a lot of a lot of people, especially when they're in a precarious situation. And then we also see that a lot, um, and I know we've, we talk about this in harm reduction all the time, is the, the care we place, uh, the burden of care we place on people for administering naloxone, um, for reversing overdoses, for things like that. And of course, you want people to have, have the ability to do that um, because they are the ones who are there. But at the same time, and I cite this probably too much, but in Knoxville, the participants who are coming to our harm reduction program reversed twice as many overdoses last year than first responders in Knoxville. And those folks are not being supported in any way, um, either financially or or otherwise, they are not being supported in doing that. And so, so much burden comes on to people who use, use drugs. Um, and of course, that caring is also an opportunity, but it, it's both, and a lot of things are both, right? And so, um, I think if we can think through ways of supporting folks who are, who are giving that care, because either we don't have other systems that are providing it, or we don't trust those systems and for very good reasons. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so you said something early on about the idea of what it takes to be seen as a good mother. Um, and so I wanna delve a little bit more into that and some of these ideas around motherhood that came up in your book. Um, so anthropologists have written critically for a, a while now about women drug users having to meet these kind of impossible standards of good motherhood. Um, and with those standards being determined by the state, often with a lot of input from um, kind of medical providers, from biomedicine. Um, and some recent examples of that are really coming from field work either in the Northeast or in California. Um, there's not been nearly as much really until your book looking at kind of what are Southern or Appalachian cultural ideas about motherhood and how those intersect with expectations of drug users and of women who are using drugs and parenting. Um, so you and I have talked a lot and recently written about kind of this idealization of Appalachian womanhood or motherhood and how policymakers tend to fetishize fetuses or babies, um, especially white babies, and then kind of set that up in opposition to the humanity of Appalachian women, people who are perceived as women. Um, and as you said, then seeing women as toxic to their own children. Um, 
So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and how that came up with the folks that you did your research with, um, especially kind of these identities, including motherhood, that women have to accept when they're interacting with government programs and how um, somebody might definitely identify as a woman or identify as a mother, but then also what it means when somebody kind of has to play a role to be able to jump through the hoops, like you said, navigate these services, go through these motions, even if it is an identify identity that they embrace, but what it means to have to play that good mother to do what the government has told you to do. Yeah, and I think with, with these women um, in, in Af who I talked to, now most, um, the vast majority were uh, non-Latinx white, and so there is some privilege there, right, of how there's an understanding of white motherhood. Um, as as being more true to middle class norms than the motherhood of people who are non-white and so there there is some privilege in how they are seen which is why i think they are given access to some of these these resources like the horizons program i just talked about but at the same time they are seen as um in appalachian studies we talk sort of about a tainted whiteness um, and so for a long time, there has been interventions in um, Appalachian motherhood that goes back um, centuries of, of questioning the ability of Appalachian women to be mothers. Uh, and, and there's not a questioning of the children. It's, it's very associated with this save the children sort of ideology of these are white children and they need to be saved. And the only way to save them is to make sure that these urban, that um, urban uh, middle class Protestant norms are being enforced. Uh, and so there's a long history of children being taken away from mothers in Appalachia uh, to be raised by people who are uh, put it in, into the, have come into Appalachia from outside or who have money. And so, um, and just as Appalachian mothers just being seen as dirty, illiterate, uh, exposing their children to ringworm, all these things uh, sort of have come together to villainize uh, Appalachian mothers. And so then you have that intersecting with the stigma against uh, women who use drugs. And so, which is perceived that if you use any substances, except if you're rich and white and use alcohol and nicotine, that's cool. Well, nicotine, maybe not as much anymore, but alcohol, yes, is still fine. But, you know, if you're not, if you're using another substance that is seen, seen as very problematic. Um, and so I think I have another quick uh, reading from one person who talked about the difference that they saw between how mothers are treated and dads are treated who use drugs. Um, I observe characterizations of women who use drugs as bad mothers continuously, whether it is in the local or national news, at community or state policy meetings, or in healthcare settings. My premature daughter was placed in a neonatal intensive care unit that is within the service area of the five counties. I talked to the nurses about drug use and neonatal absence syndrome. They sighed and rolled their eyes, and one nurse told me that she was tired of seeing babies prenatally exposed to drugs because of, quote, a series of personal and generational decisions. Women said they felt the juxtaposition of good versus bad mothers from family members in the community long before they entered treatment. Alicia, someone I talked to a lot, compared how women are treated in the community versus men. Quote, I think they put that label like she doesn't care about her kids. Dads get off easy. So I always feel like the moms judge more than the dad is. I think they put it on us like we can't make a mistake. Dad can make up for that lost time. And it goes back to this idea that boys will be boys and do their partying and do their things, but then um, moms are just not, not given that sort of grace to, to do that. And that's really interesting. This is a little bit of a tangent from the book, but that's very interesting to think about in the context of the Tennessee fetal assault law and the currently proposed legislation in North Carolina that would make it easier to take children away from somebody who's used a substance during pregnancy, including in the context of treatment, of prescribed treatment. And I mean, when you put that in the context of this history of wanting to take children away from Appalachian women to be able to give them to more fit parents, we are still seeing that happen of making it easier to take children away from Appalachian 
mothers or Appalachian people who've given birth to them. Um, so thank you for that historical context. Um, that's a good reminder. Um, yeah, and that actually, actually yeah, a, please. Another policy um, was passed through Kentucky before North Carolina, um, mm. of, and this was from the previous governor. Um, he was trying to push through quite a bit of stuff, and I think some things came through that made um, adoptions much, much quicker. Um, and so in getting, terminating uh, parental rights uh, more quickly, especially if uh, substance use was involved. So yeah, that's, that was in Kentucky as well. Yes, that's exactly what we're looking at here. Was any of that going on while you were doing your field work? It was right after. Yeah, so. Thank you. Um, so that actually leads right into some of the next things we we're going to talk about um, around gender roles and reproductive justice and intersections with harm reduction. Um, so a lot can be said about how organizing the expectations and opportunities and penalties for people who use drugs primarily around what a mother has to do to maintain or regain child custody serves the state and plays into these gendered stereotypes. Um, so you and I have talked a lot about how that highlights the need for more overlap between re reproductive justice and harm reduction. Um, and I see there's actually some other folks on the call that have been part of those conversations with us. Um, so I wonder if you could talk some more about that and specifically tell us about moments in your fieldwork or pieces in the book um, where it was really clear to you that people would have benefited um, from policies and programs that were informed more by reproductive justice, harm reduction, or both. And what were some examples that really stand out of the absence of those approaches? I mean, every single aspect of everything <laughs> that they went through could have benefited from more harm reduction and reproductive justice. And so, um, one, even before anybody had kids or pregnancy or whatnot, they just, there's no access to anything. Um, now, that has changed since I did field work there. So, Kentucky actually rolled out a syringe service program through their health departments. That was arguably the fastest rollout of that many syringe services in a state that's ever happened. Um, now, I, I don't know how effective those programs are because um, health department harm reduction programs just look different than non-harm reduction and health prior programs. And so we can talk about that, that later in state responses as well but at least they're they're there they they exist um and so one thing that starts is when you don't have that reproductive justice harm reduction aspect from the very beginning people are self-stigmatizing so quickly because every single doctor they come in contact with or nurse or any type of clinician every single um, social service provider they come in contact with is is um is not being kind, is, is yelling at them, um, and berating them and doing whatever. So you're just lacking that. And this is, again, before anybody, there's any pregnancy involved or, or child custody involved. And so um, it, it's just so hard. And the, so I talk about a few different treatment programs. Um, probably the one that had the most access aspects of harm reduction and not really reproductive justice, but kind of is of course the buprenorphine programs, which is Suboxone. Um, and those clinics, I think we're really trying to in some ways take these approaches, which was very helpful. But then the other two programs, just not even on their radar. Um, and there was a real hatred of um, medication assisted treatment. So methadone, which actually there was no access to methadone in this area. So not really worth talking about. Um, but buprenorphine hated it and used those words over and over and over again. So I talk a lot about drug court. They would not allow any um, MAT, no bup in drug court at all. Uh, just no concept of harm reduction. And they were very hardcore uh, anti-alcohol as well um, because it was a very Southern Baptist drug court. And so um, just no, no harm reduction at all, um, which is very harmful to people. And especially, yeah. And then with the other program I talked about, Horizons, they had these 
these things going on in their head. They talked about sort of harm reduction, reproductive justice type ideas, but they, it was really hard for them to implement it because they had to report back to, um, they call it DCBS, so Kentucky's version of Child Protective Services. So they had to report back to DCBS everything that went on. And if DCBS decided they didn't like what was going on at Horizons, they would stop referring women there and Horizons would dry up as a program. So anything Horizons did had to be okay with DCBS or the program would be shut down. So as you can imagine, not a lot of harm reduction or uh, repro justice is going on there because DCBS is controlling it. Um, but I think the worst pattern I saw was people having their children taken away because they were on doctor prescribed buprenorphine, which is completely illegal. But of course, as events this week and all week show us is that just because something's illegal doesn't mean the government's not going to do it. Um, and so I can read that um, story. So again, um, DCBS is Kentucky's version of Child Protective Services. So according to Kentucky DCBS literature and state level administrators, DCBS ostensibly condones the use of prescribed bube for pregnant people and parents. A DCBS regional administrator was a bit more hesitant about bube when I spoke with her. She said that newborns who show signs of being exposed to opioids should be referred to DCBS by the hospital, but this should lead to the family becoming involved with DCBS, not necessarily removal. Yet the local level administrator in these two counties where I was at, who openly stated her hatred of bup, said that if a newborn is born exposed to bup or a gestational parent tests positive for anything in addition to buprenorphine, it's an automatic removal. Adams County DCBS caseworkers told Horizons participants that even if the parents are on prescribed bup when they are pregnant, newborns with signs of exposure are automatically removed from the home. The determining fe feature appears to be signs of exposure. According to caseworkers in their interactions with women I spoke with, newborns without exposure are not removed from the home, no matter what the parent tests positive for, whether that's bup or heroin. So this mother was the first and certainly not the last to have this experience. Quote, before I got pregnant, I was on prescribed pain medication for a wreck I was in. When I got pregnant, they put me on. The baby doctor himself, I wasn't going to like no clinics or nothing. The baby doctor himself put me on Subutex, which is a form of buprenorphine. When I had my daughter, they automatically removed her from my custody and nothing was in her but what was prescribed by the doctor himself. They told me to do Horizons and as long as I stayed straight, completed it, I'd get her back. So five women of 40, five women I spoke with lost custody of their newborns at birth because they were on prescribed bup. All live in the Adams County DCBS offices district. DCBS charged all with misdemeanor neglect. A peer mentor said that the DCBS office justifies the charges by saying that women should be weaned off bute by the time they give birth. A claim that contradicts both state and regional DCBS policies detailed for me by an administrator during my interview. According to a peer mentor, this also conflicts with what women report their physicians to be telling them. She is confused by DCBS going against physicians' care or why physicians would be offering care that contradicts DCBS policies. When people who use drugs say they oppose using bup, this may not mean that they are opposed to treatment, but the negative repercussions that come from family members, the community, and DCBS when they do use bup. And so I think that's just sort of the starkest um, example I have of DCBS just not taking a harm reduction or a repro justice uh, framework at all. Thank you. And I, I wish that that were surprising. <laughs> and unfortunately, we hear similar things from folks that I've done research with here in Western North Carolina who've had similar experiences with Child Protective Services here. Um, so uh, I heard you say recently that the court-ordered treatment programs and these other systems that your participants were forced to navigate, you referred to them as failed systems, which I thought was a really powerful description. Um, so you also wrote about people's forms of resistance and community care. Um, so with that backdrop, I'm hoping we can move into talking about what you think radical community care would look like, um, and I think in a couple different layers. So we can spend um, time talking about each of these or in combination, however you want to do it. So I'm interested to hear what you think radical community care would look like for people who use drugs, 
for women who use drugs or still do and are threatened with losing their children. Um, and then kind of thinking about these current times, what radical community care could look like in this time of COVID-19. Yeah, and of course there's examples of this, of this everywhere. So um, with people who use drugs, I, like, I, like I said, the number of naloxone reversals that we had in Knoxville, that is some radical community care. I mean, um, the work and, that people do um, for each other is, is really amazing. And sometimes it is for family and friends, but oftentimes it's because you're staying at the same motel and you just see someone and you go and save them or you happen to be at the gas station or whatnot. So there's just so much that they do, um, not just for friends and family, but for the community overall. Um, and I think when you look at um, Survivors Union like you have in North Carolina, and I know that relates up to Boston as well, uh, I think that is really impressive. So it's led by and for uh, people who use drugs doing work for each other and that service work, but also policy reform work, uh, which is, uh, so vitally important because that affects services on the ground. Um, and then when it comes to parenting in general, uh, we have one, I think, example of that in, in Knoxville with the Black Mamas Bailout Fund. And so a lot of that uh, work is done uh, for folks. And then um, another example I've seen recently that I was interested intrigued by and would love to bring here is um, in Vermont, a doula program for women who are using drugs. And so you have a doula who is also someone else who is or has used drugs and not only navigating sort of the harm reduction aspect of using drugs while pregnant, but also navigating the systems that are supervising you. So help in navigating the hospital, the clinician, um, help in navigating uh, DCBS or whatever it is up there, Child Protective Services. And so I think that's so important to have someone help you both with the harm reduction sort of kind of physical aspect, but also help you with sort of these negative uh, societal responses to drug use and help you navigate that, which can be just as important and also getting resources. Um, and I know for pregnant people here, one of the biggest issues is just trying to get uh, medical care when you become pregnant and we've had such a problem with that because in order to get any services here you have to have an ID and of course a lot of people who are unhoused or marginalized in other ways don't have identification and it can be very, very hard for them to get that um, so they end up not getting any prenatal care even though they really do want it it's just very difficult to to get that um, and we've also seen an expansion of, well, I've here at least, we've seen an expansion of mutual aid during um, COVID-19. And so we have First Aid Collective Knoxville uh, here doing a lot of that, that work that has been, um, they've really stepped up when the health department has not stepped up. Social services haven't, but they have. And so and I have mixed feelings about that, not about them, they're doing amazing work, um, but that we are relying on a group of young volunteers to do all this work when we are paying tax dollars to organizations that are not doing a damn thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just, it's very frustrating that, it, and, you know, I, I appreciate them and their mutual aid work, and it's so important, and it builds community and all the good things that come from that. But I just hate that they're not better supported. Um, so I think that sort of leads into our final questions as well, and maybe we can have some discussion about that because I mutual aid is so important, but how do we get it supported so people who are doing the mutual aid are not being exploited themselves? Yeah, exactly. It's a perfect segue. So the kind of the last topic that Leslie Marie and I agreed to end on, and then we had actually talked some about kind of throwing the last part of this open to other folks that are here for this discussion, if other people have thoughts. Um, I was going to invite Leslie Marie to talk some about what radical community care, how it can work in the context of failed systems, and what the role of the state is. Um, and we had talked some the other day about whether or not the state can ever truly provide care. Um, and if it can do it well. Um, 
And so Liz and Marie, I wanna ask you to talk to us about um, now that you've studied the limitations of a state-based model of care that forces people who are perceived as women into these inaccessible treatment programs and then penalizes them for not being able to jump through all those hoops. Um, what, when you try to envision it, what can you envision as possible non-state responses? What would be an anti-capitalist or even anarchist model for community care and harm reduction? Um, so I'd love to hear about that from you. And then if other people have thoughts, I think we're really interested to hear that also. Yeah, and I think I, I'm not as versed in this as probably, well, I know some people on this call are, and because I'm really just getting into it. And I think I, I left Kentucky thinking that, well, these are just really bad programs. And they're, but, when, you know, when I talk to people in Kentucky at the state level, they seem to have all these great ideas and they were really good people with really good intentions. Um, and then I got a job at a state health department and I understood better what it means to work for the state and that you are governed by the legislature, which in Tennessee is very red and will be very red for a long time, I think, unless COVID just blows everything out of the water, which maybe it will. But um, I, I've not seen a state system work except in supporting the power of the elite. Um, I, I don't understand how it could work in this time and place. So that has led me to a lot of anarchist readings and I'm trying to um, learn more about that and understand more about that um, than I did going into this but I, I don't see how a state system can work um, within our capitalist society. But at the same time, I don't see how people who are not within the state can get the resources they need to do what they need to do if we are still in this capitalist system. So it has to be one in the same of, of being anti-capitalist and anti-state. Um, and so, how do you how do you redistribute the wealth how do you get the wealth to people um without having some sort of state system in place for long enough to do that and i i don't i mean i i'm sure people out there have the answers but i i'm just trying to understand that better um for how that that could work um but because again there's there's things about mutual aid that get away from the nonprofit industrial complex which are so good because it, um, it allows people to be on the same level and to help each other who are at the same level instead of having all these crazy eligibility requirements and things you have to live up to to get into the nonprofit system. Um, and there's so much money that goes into the nonprofit system that is not coming out anywhere That's, that makes an impact. So. Sorry, folks, just a, if you want to roll back Leslie Marie just a sec. Um, I think we accidentally had you on mute for just the last uh, 30 seconds of what you were saying. Yeah, no, I was just, it's my confusion that I was saying. <laughs> That's about it. Is that like, I, I don't really know where to go from here. Um, but I think there are ways forward. And I think that there's a lot of collective effort to, to go forward. And so um, I would just love to be part of that. So I guess I'm tempted before we throw it open to other people to, I mean, I want to end on, I don't want to say a positive note, but like if, if you had a anti-capitalist non-state system within which you could provide reproductive justice informed harm reduction services to the folks you worked with, like if you could have anything, what would that look like? Like what would you want that program to look like? Cool. So we want to hear from folks, right? Who yeah. are, who are here. So yeah. Um, Y'all, if you want to share your thought in response to that prompt, uh, there's um, a series of little flags that you can throw up um, on the right hand side uh, in the like participant list to like raise your hand. 
So you could click on one of those and I would then be able to see that you uh, wanted to speak or alternately just post in the chat and I'll, I'll catch you and unmute you so that you can share back. Um, and I guess while people are figuring out the technology, uh, I'll respond, um, uh, which is just, I, I think actually there's like kind of an interesting um, set of like real world examples going on right now um, in the streets. Uh, and I think, uh, I, I don't know how many people have seen uh, the kind of photos of the tents that were set up where like uh, essentially like looted merchandise from Target uh, was being like redistributed to protesters on the streets yesterday. Um, uh, and I, I thought, you know, I mean, obviously that's like, that's like in the context of sort of like a social rebellion. Um, so not a model for perhaps every day, or maybe it is a model for every day. I don't know. But I, I think that like, it speaks to that question of like, what does it look like for a community to come together, identify each other's needs and redistribute um, resources? Uh, so I don't know, just kind of a, a cool one from within the, the current news cycle. Anybody else want to jump in and share a thought here? Love to hear from you. And if people don't have answers to that very big question, I would say also there's plenty of room for the overall Q and A. Yeah, and we can we can roll into some people's questions because some did get uh, get posed. Maybe um, people should feel free to come back to the prompt uh, that Bela shared. It's not like we we can't revisit this one. Um, so just looking at uh, the kind of things that people put in the chat box. Um, and it looks like these are things that I'll share. Uh, again, reminder that if, if you want to speak, please, and it would be awesome to hear your voices, uh, but I'll assume that you want me to ask things unless you tell me otherwise. Um, so the first question that got asked there was, um, I think for uh, Leslie Marie, and um, that question was, did you interview anyone that received intensive in-home services? And if so, did it have positive outcomes for anyone? Yes, so there was a few programs and it was based on um, people's parenthood, not on their um, substance use. And it depended on which county people were in. So if it was in a county where people were nice about delivering those services, then it had incredible um, positive effects. And so especially if people could um, deliver material resources for that. And so, for example, I know um, someone got like a wood burning stove as well as um, as well as food resources and some um, like baby resources. So that was really helpful for them. Um, and that was in a county where the folks really liked the one person who was doing that because she was just a really lovely, nice person. Uh, in another county where that was happening, um, people felt like it was another form of surveillance. They felt like they had to scrub their houses clean. They had to get everything in order and they, um, we're also having their having being referred to DCBS for pretty minor things that actually weren't on them that were on their landlord. So, for example, if someone saw chipping paint, um, if they came in, they would refer them to DCBS, and of course, that shouldn't be on them. It should be on the, the landlord. Or if they saw um, electrical outlets that might be worrisome, and so it I think it depends on who's delivering the service, which is what makes it so tricky. Okay, I'm gonna ask another question from the chat box. Um, let's see, so could you talk about the future possibilities and opportunities of harm reduction strategies? Um, this individual who's asking says that they've been thinking through ways to support people who can become pregnant in areas without resources outside of the state or without state funding and would love to hear what you're thinking about the future of harm reduction work. Yeah, and I think, um, so we've tried to start doing this with just basic education, which isn't much, and I know that. Um, but at least helping people understand that if they're using while they're pregnant, there are some things that can be um, safer to them um, than other things. 
And so what they can use that might be safer, what they can do and making sure they get the resources um, through us. But there's only so much we can do and there's only so much um, folks like mutual aid groups can do and what we can do doesn't really compare to give, getting someone access to um, Medicaid. Uh, Cause we, we don't have the resources to do that or to um, SNAP benefits or to housing. Um, and I think if there's ways that you could do that without the state, it would be really lovely, but I don't know where we would get the resources to do that. Um, and again, I, I feel like the best thing I've seen recently was harm reduction doulas. Um, I just thought they were so fantastic. Um, but yeah, that's where I'm struggling is the resource gap. I mean, we can only do so much with what we have. All right, and if folks have maybe follow-ups on these topics, it would be great if, you know, again, this doesn't have to be like a one-way conversation. If people want to chime in, um, share responses to other people's questions, I think that'd be awesome because um, uh, I, I know there's a lot of knowledge in the room right now and I uh, would love to hear more of that. So again, you can kind of use the little hand raise icon uh, or alternately throw it in the chat if you want to want to chime in. Um, but while we're waiting on folks to do that, I'll go ahead and roll into kind of a next uh, question from the chat box. Um, and this one looks like it's got a couple pieces. Um, so do you have any thoughts about how we can mitigate the co-option of harm reduction, mutual aid, and sort of radical language by the state? Um, this person is thinking about state support for harm reduction that then ends up trying to push people into treatment and the dead people never recover rhetoric that seems to be increasingly popular? It's a good question. I'd love to hear everybody's thoughts on this one. Yeah, and I know there's issues in some places of uh, the health department coming in and like even taking over the spaces of other harm reduction groups and whew, like just wolf. Um, <laughs> It's, I mean, that's, that's hard. And so um, I, it's, it's I, I've not done this successfully either because I sat down, I was about to be on a panel with someone from a health department, a harm reduction program in Kentucky. And they came up to me before and they were like, I am a hardcore harm reductionist. I'm like, okay, cool, let's roll. And then they started saying stuff and I was like, what the hell? Um, because they were just talking about how if, if people are on BUP, you know, they need to be taking birth control and they're forced to take birth control at the same time. And, you know, this is really just about getting people into recovery and treatment. And I was like, what is happening? Um, and so I just tried to keep redirecting the conversation, but I'm not sure how well that worked. Um, so yeah, any strategies of of doing that I think would be helpful because um, it, it's it's hard when you get put in a room or especially on a panel in front of 50 or 75 people and they're saying that they're a hardcore harm reduction and, and then just spewing stigma. Um, I, yeah, I tried to redirect as best I could, but I'm not sure I react well in that situation. And I'm sure people who have done reproductive justice work see this all the time too, um, any type of this work. It just gets taken up and rebranded um, into something pretty dirty, which in East Tennessee has, they've taken up sort of the wording around reproductive justice to try to coerce people who use drugs to uh, get long acting reversible and contraceptives. And so taken up all the time. Um, I, I've struggled with it. Mm. Bailey, Can do you I have jump a in? on all that? Yeah, jump yeah, in. Um, yeah, because we've got so many examples here. I, this is probably career suicide, but I'm getting to the point where I just call it out. Um, there is a particular organization locally in Asheville that likes to call itself harm reduction and is currently actively doing things that increase people's risk of overdose. Um, and so with somebody else's study, we are like on the verge of 
we are trying, we are actively trying to get a commentary about it published. Like we're gonna just call it out. Like you can't say you do harm reduction and then try to kill people. So yeah, I mean, I think doing that on a panel, that would be really hard. Like I, I don't quite know what I would do if it were in the moment, but I think when you find out it's happening, trying to just say like, this is what people are doing and these are the dangers and these are the risks and I don't know that like, I feel like that's why I'm an applied medical anthropologist is so I can say research tells me that this thing is not okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's really hard to do because precisely because of that resource gap, I think. Um, like that's what I always come back to is the people that are willing to say, this is dangerous, this is not okay, are then risking the, the public funding. And that's why the health departments get the funding to do the harm reduction is they don't rock the boat. And then they do it in the non-evidence-based way and they do it in the way that isn't informed by what drug users need and they keep getting the money. And the folks that actually talk to people who use drugs and actually ask people what they want to do with their reproductive autonomy and take that risk, don't get the money. So if someone can solve that problem, I'd be very grateful. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic uh, to Kay who wanted to ask a question. Kay, if you wanna give that a shot, I think you, you should me? be, yes. Okay. Um, Kay, thank you. Yeah, I figured I would talk, cause why not? Um, to, Y'all were talking about um, like mutual aid and things getting kind of co-opted and it reminded me of, I was on a, um, a Zoom call with Dean Spade, who's a, a trans mutual aid um, activist and scholar. Uh, and he uh, was very poignant about saying that like the purpose of mutual aid was not to have it be co-opted by the state because oftentimes uh, the state will like ignore and criminalize mutual aid activities and then co-opt them uh but then they won't um be accessible or available to like a whole slew of populations um and that you know once the state co-ops things it like demobilizes a lot of folks so they just stop doing the work because they're like oh the government's doing it um so i just wanted to give him a shout out uh but that was on my question um i am a uh case manager in Philly, um, very different from uh, the uh, environment you uh, wrote about in your book, but um, it uh, had this one uh, line in your book that like really stuck out to me. It's, uh, if every bias service provider altered their attitude, they would still be working in underfunded programs with problematic policies serving populations marginalized by exploitative economic and political practices. Okay, I think we lost you there on your audio. Are you, I'm gonna ask you to unmute again. Thank you. I Great, if you'll just roll myself. back. We only lost about uh, five seconds of what you were saying. Cool, <laughs> um, but yeah, that when I read that quote, I was like, it felt uh, very close to where my, uh, where I'm feeling working in a uh, nonprofit uh, housing provider agency. Um, or homeless services provider agency. Uh, and I was just curious what you, in your both your professional work and in um, what you saw in your research, how folks that are doing, our service providers have, like that are in either the state or nonprofit world have uh, individually mitigated some of the, um, whether with policy or just completely saying fuck it to the policy and just risking something um, to kind of mitigate the cyclical nature that like nonprofit work can do. Does that question make sense? Yeah, and I think a lot of it is just leaving it, which is not great or being fired from it. A lot of people got fired. Um, yeah. That's what I, I figured. I, I, cause I, I, like to your point, I was like, you know, the non nonprofit world isn't gonna um, like end things, but while some folks are stuck in it, uh, how can kind of alleviate it whilst in it? But sorry, that was my only. 
No, I think some, sometimes it was the side conversations that it kind of helped people. But I think that again, almost goes back to some of the stigma discrimination, the stigma piece, which, um, yeah, being stigmatized against and being treated like shit really suck. But for the people I, I talked to, what sucked even more is not having a house to live in. And it's like, even if everyone was nice to them and they didn't have a house to live in, that was a bigger problem for them or a place to live and so um or food to eat or child care or all those material things um but i think how i saw some people mitigate it one was just being incredibly kind and having side conversations and some of those conversations of being like look i know dcbs is being really unfair but this is how the state is working and this is how we can try to get you through this even though i know dcbs sucks um, and some of that sort of mutual understanding can just be helpful. And then also people really going out of their way to just try to do what they can with limited resources. And so one of the case managers I um, talk about who was a person with um, quite a bit of lived experience with everything that other people had gone through, um, man, people celebrated her because what she could do with a roll of duct tape was like freaking impressive. Um, and what she could do with like super glue. And, you know, I mean, she was fixing air conditioners and fixing car engines and doing all these things, but that people loved her. Um, and I know why it was because she loved them. Um, and so I think it was some of that mutual care, even within a resource um, desert. And then I think there's also ways of just doing things that are not on work time, right? Which all, all of us do and understanding that maybe we can't do it with the face of our organization, but maybe we can find other um, people to do it with or um, just writing pieces and maybe not even with your own name, um, writing it with other people or writing it as unnamed um, and getting that out there. Uh, so I think there's there's ways to get through it, but it's really hard. And also going to organizational leadership and make, making them, asking them to read about abolition and asking them to read about all these things. If they're, if maybe if they're not on board, then, okay, can I bring a book and we can have a book discussion? Will you guys read this about some things that they see as too radical, but really they shouldn't see as that. And so, um, or they may not see as being related to the work you're doing and being able to show, well, no, this is directly tied to what we're doing and this is why we need to be fight, um, supporting these folks. So those are just a few of the ways I've seen or I've found. I think that, did that answer your question at all? Oh, I think Kay's back on yet. Um, Kay, I don't know if you wanna okay. just. Um, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I think that I, uh, I do some harm reduction work with Soul Collective. It's a collective in Philly. Um, and it's it just for me personally, it helps my brain feel like I'm actually doing something except like, whereas my job, like not as much. Um, but uh, yeah, no, these were, these were helpful. Uh, it's nice to just get any insight. Um, I like the, I think the, the initial one being like, leave was probably like really valid. Um, and so at some point we'll get there, you know. Thanks. So we've got a, another um, sort of hand up here that uh, I'm going to um, see if uh, Sam wants to join the conversation. Sam, let us know when you are. Uh... I'm good. Awesome. Um, so I was just going to respond to Kay. Um, I actually am a former case manager uh, turned harm reductionist. Um, and so uh, I think that I totally agree with Paul Zamperi, um that leaving was really good for me. Um, that being said, I know that's not an option for everyone, um, but before I kind of reached the, the end of my time doing case management, I think that probably the thing that helped me the most, and I think benefited my clients the most, was just being really willing, and perhaps this may have been detrimental to my career had I stayed, um, but I was just really honest with people, like, if the organization I was connecting them to had, like, shitty politics or, like, expected them to, like, pray in order to get food or something like that, like, I would tell them that, like, from the jump and, like, 
try to at least min minimize those barriers as much as possible. Um, like, it didn't make it not suck, um, but it helped build, I think, a level of rapport with people um, that, like, a lot of the stuffier case managers who, like, were very by the book and unwilling to, like, help them, like, figure out how to get the medical care that they needed without, like, jumping through all kinds of hoops or, like, telling them what to say, like, that was really helpful. So I think if you can find spaces to do that, I think that that's something that might help a little bit as well. So we've got about five or 10 more minutes. Um, so if anybody's got a question that maybe they've been sitting on that they'd like to, to toss out there, you can either type it into the chat or give me some sign that you want to, uh, to be in the conversation and I'll, I'll throw you in. All right, well, um, Ayla and Leslie Marie, do you have any final thoughts that maybe you'd like to share with, uh, with folks? It's been a really awesome conversation and I appreciate everything you all shared. Leslie Marie, do you wanna say anything about Hellbender harm reduction and then we can maybe say something about study before we wrap up? Yeah, sure. Um, so all of my proceeds are going to a fund that um, my partner and I created Hellbender harm reduction which uh, we're hoping will support um, harm reduction services and reproductive justice services um, in Appalachia. And before I say anything more about it, I, you know, you should always support your local harm reduction program. You should always support your local reproductive justice program. But um, I hear there are places that might actually have well-funded harm reduction programs. So if you're in one of those places, um, I think this is a way to get resources out to people in, in Appalachia. Um, and yeah, so I know some people also don't have a harm reduction program or RJ program within their, uh, where they live. So it's just a way to, to get it out to grassroots organizations that are going to be doing this. Um, yeah. Cool. And it looks like, um, I don't think that there's anybody else on from study. So, um, and I'm also, I don't wanna assume that folks on the call either do or do not know about study, but um, I don't know, Liberty, between the two of us, we can probably give a quick overview. Study Collective um, is a local Asheville-based uh, harm reduction and syringe access program. Um, the current schedule in these times of COVID and mobile services, they are parked outside Firestorm on Tuesdays and by the Haywood Street Congregation on Wednesdays and at Pisgah View Apartments on Fridays. And the exact hours, I think, vary sometimes, so it's always good to get up on their social media, Instagram or Facebook, uh, Study Collective. Um, but they are, I would say, I am biased because I am their community research liaison, but um, based on several years of research now, I would say that they are the most community-based um, radical community care example of harm reduction um, in Western North Carolina. Um, there are some other fantastic folks doing harm reduction stuff further to the west. The North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition has a couple staff based in Haywood County, but as far as Asheville goes, um, if you want to see radical community care, it's Steady Collective. Um, so definitely, if you're looking for folks to support locally, it would be them. You want to add anything to that, Liberty? I, that was great. That was great. Thank you. And a huge thanks to Firestorm for hosting them for since they started, really. Yeah, since day one. Well, everyone, this has been awesome. Um, I want to, again, encourage everybody to um, pick up a copy of RX Appalachia, from which we heard readings tonight. It's a, it's a really good read. It's, it's smart, but it's also very narrative. Um, I found it to be, like, easy to read, and I am definitely not, like, versed in the world of, like, academia or like kind of like medical research. Um, and I'll also go ahead and throw up, um, this is Bela's title, 
a health policy in a time of crisis. Um, if you thought Bela sounded real smart tonight, definitely check out this book, which is also a really great read, um, uh, covering some very different topics, but also I think with some some notable points of thematic overlap. So I'm going to put the um, the links for both of those in the chat box again, real quick. And uh, thanks, Liberty. I will say all the proceeds from my book go to Firestorm if you buy it at Firestorm or through their website. That's true. Thank you so much. It's a love fest here. Oh, awesome. Well, speaking of love fest, appreciate everybody who joined us tonight. Um, and uh, definitely keep an eye out for uh, more events in the near future with Firestorm. This kind of wraps up the first three author uh, events that we booked. Um, but I, I feel like these went well enough and we've enjoyed them so much that we'll, we'll definitely have some posted up for June soon. Um, we set a high bar with these first three. So. Um, Thanks so much, uh, Bela and Leslie Marie. This has been really lovely. Thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all. Take care. <laughs>